Look, storytelling is not easy. If it was, we would all do it, and trying to make a narrative flow is hard. It's so easy to forget the little elements which could result in a plot hole, and it's why authors have to send their finished pieces of work to a publisher so they can go through it first. Get that red pen out and circle all the errors. It's a process, and a delicate one at that. The issue when it comes to pro wrestling is that many of these stories are being told week to week and changing a hundred times before we actually get to see them happen in the ring. Given this and how many tales they're trying to tell, sometimes the whole experience blows up up not just in WWE's face, but the fans' face as well. Something makes no sense or just falls flat after so much momentum, and then we have to sit around feeling sad. And sadness is not the dream. I'm Simon from What Culture, and this is 10 times WWE Completely Blue Major Storylines. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to stay notified. Ding, ding, done. Number 10, The Fall of Ryback. You may have forgotten about it now, but at one time Ryback had all the momentum in the world. He was undefeated, had the crown behind him, and had a catchphrase people enjoyed chanting. The man who liked to be fed had everything. He just needed a big win, and then John Cena got injured. Taking him out of the Hell in a Cell main event against CM Punk in 2012, WWE needed a replacement, and who better than someone who was already over? Fans would accept that, and more so, there was a built-in story as it was title versus Ryback's undefeated streak and that just works. It didn't really matter what happened here either, because someone had to lose. So when Ryback got absolutely screwed by corrupt referee Bad Maddox, it was quite an enticing story. How would Ryback get his revenge? And that's where things exploded. While all of this could have been used to cement the former Skip Sheffield at the top of the card, instead he became cannon fodder for The Shield when they first debuted, and then lost at the Royal Rumble and WrestleMania. So in the space of a few months, he'd gone from on top of the world to just another guy. We all know what happened afterwards, and it really was a misstep by WWE. If we had treated Ryback a bit better, we could have been onto something here. But nope, let's just run him into the ground instead. Works for me though, because now, I can become the Wyback. Number 9, WCW Losers A lot of good talent jumped to WWE throughout the Attitude Era. Chris Jericho and Taz are always performers who spring to mind, but surely the biggest night in terms of quantity was when the Radicals, or Eddie Guerrero, Perry Saturn, Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko, all made the move from Nitro to appear on Raw in one Nets episode of WWE's flagship program. From the off, there was an air of intrigue, because who knew exactly what they were going to do? We did know that it was Radicals with a Z because this was the early 2000s when life was stupid, but other than that, this was a free home run. And then they all lost in one night. Malenko fell to X-Pac, Eddie and Perry were beaten by the New Age Outlaws, and Benoit was defeated by Triple H. Now, on one hand, this made sense. Vince McMahon had been telling his audience for years WCW was second class, they couldn't come in and be dominant. People might actually then think Ted Turner's organization was better. That's clearly bonkers thinking, but hey, things were tense during the Monday Night Wars. The problem was, instead of feeling like a group of awesome renegades, they were now just losers. They turned up, and they got beat. Bruce Pritchard claimed on his podcast this was done to give the foursome somewhere to go. If they just rock up and win, what do you do then? My answer would be win again. What do I know? Number 8, Randy Orton's return. After Seth Rollins betrayed The Shield in 2014 and joined the Authority, his real problem outside of an unhinged Dean Ambrose was Randy Orton. A classic case of egos clashing as they both wanted to be the guy, there was an atmosphere between both from the off. We had some alpha males here that weren't going to back down. This was teased wonderfully for ages until Seth lost his rag one night and curb stopped Orton's face into the still steps. This was the reason for having Randy vanishing from TV, even though reality was shooting a movie, and the plan was for a match at WrestleMania. This is why everyone went nuts at Fastlane when the Viper returned and gave Kane and J&J &J security some RKO's. 24 hours later though, we didn't pull the trigger here and just let the fans cheer Orton. We pretended that he actually wanted to make amends with Rollins until a few weeks later, where he showed his true colors anyway. We didn't need this as we were all ready to get behind Orton and all this did was dilute the whole thing. He shifted into that mode eventually, but all that stuff in between ruined it. A fact is a fact. Number 7, Seth Rollins' return. Amazingly, this exact same scenario happened a year or so later when Seth Rollins had to make his own comeback. Shelved due to a knee injury, WWE did such a good job in building his return, fans were desperate to cheer him after recovering from what had seemed like a proper ordeal. Not only did we miss him, but it was time to get behind him. So when Roman Reigns had beaten AJ Styles at Extreme Rules, Seth ran down the ramp and pedigreed the big dog with one clear message. You've got my title, I want it back. Perfect. The audience loved this as they did when he came out on Raw the next night, and then it happened. After teasing he loved the crowd, he turned on them and just fell back into his old bad guy persona. That killed the idea dead, and when he eventually did turn face for real, he had to play catch up before it caught on. 
In many ways, it's only been now, in June 2018, that it's all started to click, and this is a huge reason for that. Number 6. Oh, Canada. In 2004, Vince McMahon decided that if you were a good guy and from Canada, well, you weren't from Canada anymore. Telling Chris Jericho he was now from New York and Chris Benoit from Georgia, it seemed the idea was to play off something that had happened a year earlier when we took a group of un-Americans and portrayed them as super heels for this very reason. Putting Tess, Christian, William Regal and Lance Storm together, the only issue the company had was that the two former individuals had long hair. That would need to be cut for the good of the group. Now that makes no sense again because who cares, but after thinking about it, Christian and Tess refused. That annoyed management and the whole angle was scrapped. This was an overreaction to say the least and given the lengths WWE would eventually go on to in the sense they made Canadians honorary Americans, all of this could have been huge with the right push. It got sillier as well because when the pair did cut their hair in 2003, nobody cared. It was barely acknowledged on TV and within a week the landscape hadn't changed at all. Almost like cutting your hair doesn't make that big of a difference all things considered. Number 5. The Nexus It's incredibly hard to build one brand new star from scratch, let alone eight, but WWE had that in their grasp before letting it slip away. It was nuts. Angry with the system and felt like they'd been screwed, the graduates of the original season of NXT decided to kick John Cena's ass and destroy as much of the WWE as they could to try and prove a point. Don't take us lightly or muck around with us, we all take this very seriously. Though they lost Daniel Bryan due to a real-life firing in the first week, the other seven were considered enough of a threat that there was a sense of danger about them. Instantly, a huge group of guys felt like they could upset the landscape in a serious way. Unfortunately, WWE simply wouldn't quite commit to getting the new heels all the way over the line, and anything they did have was then killed and then some when at that year's SummerSlam they lost against a team assembled by John Cena. Leader Wade Barrett was basically outthought by Cena constantly when all was said and done, the Englishman was in a position where things had to be reset. There was an attempt to save all this when CM Punk took charge, but by then, the damage was done and it was too late. Number 4. Booker T vs Triple H When Booker T took on Triple H at WrestleMania 19, everything became very difficult very quickly. Aside from it being time for the game to drop his World Heavyweight Championship, which he didn't, Booker T probably needed to win it, especially given everything that had been said in the build-up. Having earned the shot thanks to a Battle Royale victory a week before, Booker faced off with Triple H, who started to suggest that an African-American performer was merely a sideshow act compared to a top guy like him. Follow-up segments saw Flair suggesting Booker couldn't compare to Tiger Woods or Michael Jordan, and that he should carry their bags and chauffeur them around instead. At one point, Triple H threw money at Booker in a bathroom stall and then asked for a towel. It was a hideously ugly storyline with virtually no positives, and it fell off a cliff when Trips won clean at the show of shows, meaning he never got his cutuppers. This was awful, so very, very awful. Number 3. Triple H and Kurt Angle The 2000 love triangle featuring Triple H, Kurt Angle and Stephanie McMahon was surprisingly good. A centerpiece of Raw for months, the development of the angle had been absolutely magnificent. Then head writer Chris Kursky saw each wrestler as a character no different from a scripted cast, and thus tried to frame interconnecting plots around standard important pro wrestling tropes. You know what? It worked. So with that in mind, Triple H and Kurt Angle were put on similar trajectories, being awesome in the ring while also vying for the eye of Steph. As a husband, this made perfect sense for the game, but the budding relationship between Kurt and Hunter's wife was a different animal. Slowly, the audience was subtly let in to Angle's true intentions and were left wondering if perhaps the feeling was mutual following a few eyebrow-raising moments. This all peaked during the dramatic triple threat WWE title match at SummerSlam featuring The Rock. However, when a singles match forced Stephanie to choose, she did so all too easily, apparently because Triple H decided he didn't want any of this to continue. And after all, who would really pick Kurt over him? McMahon low-blowed the Olympian, and that was that. It was over from nowhere. Number 2. The Lack of Flair Bailey's women's title victory over Charlotte on the February 13, 2017 edition of Monday Night Raw came out of nowhere. Aside from the fact WrestleMania was just around the corner, which is where the hugger should have won the belt, Charlotte had also been trading the title back and forth with Sasha Banks far too much, which made it feel like a hot potato. There's no consistency here. There was a sense that maybe this would start to click if Charlotte then regained the gold at Fastlane before losing it to Bailey at the Showcase of the Immortals. This would have been dumb for reasons already mentioned, but at least it would create some kind of roller coaster and keep the Queen's pay per view winning streak intact. But we didn't do this. Bailey beat her there as well, throwing Charlotte's run out the window like it was trash. Bailey did at least defend her title at Mania 33, but by this point, it did feel a bit like we'd already lost our way, because this could have been so much more. Number 1. The Invasion There's no two ways about it, the flubbing up of WCW invading WWE was one of the biggest busts in wrestling history. How a dream scenario for pretty much every fan on the planet could go so badly is anyone's guess, but it did, 
and it still hurts today. The real issue was just how stupidly it was put together. World Championship Wrestling were booked to look weak from the off, and the only time they got any momentum was when WWE stars jumped ship, and then it was just WWE versus WWE. What? WCW never had a chance to establish themselves as any kind of threat. And while there was some logic to not bringing people like Goldberg in, the money he would have wanted could have upset the current pay structure, that seems ludicrous when you think about how much cash this could have made. Even as it was, it drew crazy numbers, and that's without the faces we wanted to see. Anyone who did come in was quickly jobbed out, and by the time it was over, most fans had checked out on the whole storyline. This should have lasted years. Instead, it was over within months. How on earth? <laughs> oh, 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 wasn't that something? Don't forget to like, share and subscribe below. And also, the people who made this lovely video, they're appearing right here. But if you're thinking to yourself, I want to see more content, Jules, then why not look above my head, as there probably is some. I don't know. I can't see it. Until next time.